Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and good afternoon. And uh, from wherever you are, just want to thank you for coming on to the, the late one tonight. And we've got a very exciting evening. Interesting evening, I must say, interesting and exciting. And one of the reasons why it's exciting and interesting is, you know, we've got this COVID-19 um, coronavirus, which has been going around for a while. And you've got many different experts, people commenting on it. You've got a lot of experts, people who are doctors, people who are not doctors, people who are medical experts, but I understand that they actually work in a sweet shop at the hospital. I understand also that they also may be a janitor in the hospital or whatever like that, but everybody's a medical expert. And I don't know the full ramification of COVID-19. Many of us do not know. And I believe more information that we have is very crucial and very prudent at this time. Secondly, um, one of the reasons why I've invited my guests to come on as well is also to destroy another myth to say that um, the medical fraternity is somewhat whitewash because we know without a doubt that there are many uh, black professionals within the NHS and doctors in the UK. Some of them are just getting on with their business, just getting on with the job. And, and without a doubt, um, they play a fundamental part. We also, at the same time, we have seen that um, on the medical front, uh, a few doctors have passed away and you know, God, you know, you know, may God rest it on their soul and um, you know, condolences to the family. But they are on the front line and every Thursday, the UK, we come out and we applaud the medical fraternity, the NHS. We applaud as well the different organization, essential services. I believe also the supermarket. The supermarket also are very essential services as well, which is out there. And and today I've got um, uh, a Mr. Uh, David Burton and Dr. Carl, Carla Campbell Burton, and they'll be coming on later today. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a discussion. We're going to have a discussion on many different factors. But without further ado, I, I think it is best that I just invite Mr. And let's see if I can find him. Yes, I got him. David Burton. Good evening, Silborn. Good evening. And thank you so much for joining on. And, Good evening, uh, listeners. Yes, yes. How are you doing? I'm OK. Um, basking in the sunshine today in the, in the backyard, in the confines right. of the home. Ah, uh, at one at one point, I was I thought you were gonna say um, basking on the sunshine in Malibu. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> no, no, not in Malibu. <laughs> not in Malibu. In sunny, in, in sunny Manchester. I, I I I have a saying which I say a lot, and the saying is I'm I'm chilling in the Malibu, and many people right. take that as if it is literally that I'm in the Malibu, but for me, Malibu is like a state of mind, like a state of being. It is like saying, I'm chilling, you know? Yeah. And it's not rum. Many people think I'm talking about rum. I'm not talking about rum. I'm talking about chilling in the Malibu state of being, you know? And- so uh, a state of kind of wellness and kind of uh, um, equilibrium. Yes, and, and, and also of health, with health uh, as well. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, um, uh, David Burton, um, MBCHB, B Medic Science. David, I'm just reading this thing. I know, I know. Frocker <laughs> PTH <laughs> uh, Mr. David Bird is a GMC registered consultant, um, ophthalmologist, surgeon, ophthalmologist, working in the NHS. He has worked in several regions in the UK, inclusive of Yorkshire, the Northwest, the Midlands and London. He has a keen interest postgraduate medical education and continues to bridge a gap by conducting health forums within the black community. He's a cause of this coach, a platform he shared with his wife, where we discuss all manners of subjects. Uh, Dr. Carla Campbell Burton and um, his wife, and um, hopefully she may be able to come on, I think, um, taking care of their, ch their child at the same time. We're all on lockdown, so the family's all getting tighter. Uh, so Carla, all being well, we'll come back later and I'll introduce her with more details when she come on, if she's able to. David, David, COVID-19, we'll go straight into it. COVID-19 coronavirus. Um, the, it, it has been in the circuit a bit. 
yeah. you know, in I think in December, people weren't taking it very serious, yeah. right? People weren't taking it very serious that even to the point when it was actually happening, uh, it wasn't touching Africa, it wasn't touching um, uh, black people to a certain extent. They say, oh, black people don't worry about it, young people don't worry about it, you know. I, I want your perspective, and instead of us getting into my description or whatever, from your medical perspective, can you break down coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 for us? Sure, of course. So, um, again, thanks for inviting me on this evening to talk about this subject. Um, I won't say it's dear to my heart, it's just something that is obviously touched the NHS and touched the world uh, over, um, but particularly uh, for my working practice in the NHS. Now, COVID-19 came into fruition in 2019, hence the name 19. Yes. And, the, and, the, and the COVID part is uh, really relates to the CO, which is the coronavirus, and the virus itself. Um, and it, it, it came into December. It was probably a good, a good, good, good description. But November, December, um, it was described firstly in um, the place of origin in Wuhan um, by a consultant ophthalmologist. Yes, who was first alerted to a particular type of pneumonia, which is an infection of the chest. Um, and whilst I'm not a chest physician, I know that's an infection of the chest, um, and um, essentially caused a, a, a numerous amounts of, uh, of, of ill health within that population. And so he was first alerted to this particular problem. Um, as I've said, it's, it's related to the lungs, um, but um, as I'm sure most people are aware, it can cause an array of different symptoms. Um, and the symptoms, namely, um, that we have all been asked to take um, or pay attention to are, are that of a high temperature, a persistent high temperature, yes. uh, and a persistent cough as well. Uh, those are the two crucial symptoms that um, are, uh, are, are basically a requirement for, for, for everybody to be aware of. There are other symptoms we could touch on in a second, but I just want to make sure people are aware of that. Now, as I said, it started in, 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 in China, and you made reference to the fact that it wasn't really um, sort of taken on board by, I guess, the rest of the world. Um, so we kind of slept, I think all of us, to a manner of degree of fashion, slept on this, kind of, this, this, this virus for a little while, and even though it was in public domain and people um, we're paying slight attention to it. It probably wasn't acknowledged as much as we really wanted it to have been. Um, and so it, it's, it's touched every country, I think, uh, across the world now. Um, and there are a degree of ways of dealing with this particular condition, which we'll, which we'll I'm sure draw reference to shortly. But I just wanted to yes. make clear that this is, uh, is, a, is a virus. It's not like your normal flu virus. It has um, far greater implications in regards to um, how people are affected, um, whether that's been um, sort of the the admission to hospital or onto the intensive care unit, um, yes. and, and quite obviously the the, the 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 unfortunate passing of life that can follow. Yes, and 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 ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome and those coming on now um, on the late one. I've got Mr. Uh, Carlo, Mr. David Burton, who is on and we're talking about COVID-19, please share this video as well. It would be grateful if you share it because we'll have information. And as well, it would be greatly appreciated if you also have some questions that you can actually put down and David will see what he can do at the same time. Uh, David, one of the pet peeves at this time regarding coronavirus is, uh, but let's look at the government aspect. There, there, was, there was this thing which was going on on the initial stage in the UK uh, about this thing called herd immunity. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the government measures, and uh, I believe that there have been a, a U-turn. Not sure if there's been a U-turn. I'm trying to navigate this thing all the while. Mm. And uh, what's your perspective on the government measures as to where they're at? And this herd immunity, for instance. Yes. Sure. I mean, so let's touch on the herd immunity aspect first of all. So, um, the notion here, um, very basically, is that um, we can essentially inoculate ourselves to um, the virus um, across the population yeah. to protect ourselves at the same time. Now that herd immunity concept has really been um, a, a concept that's driven by vaccination. Okay, mm -hmm. so once people are vaccinated, then you can use that as a model. That's a general concept. Yes. Now the, the problem with the initial um, uh, one of the one of the problems with the initial sort of concept being um, uh, being a primary focus of the government at the time was that um, it didn't really look at the other aspects, which were namely a uh, closing down of borders, for example, yes. um, which would then stop other people coming in from other parts of the world that may 
or may not be effective, but essentially bringing more people into the country with unknown um, infection levels. And, and also the fact that I just pointed out that herd immunity is something that is a concept um, and requirement in regards to vaccinations. And we don't currently have a vaccination for this particular uh, virus. Mm. Um, and that particular vaccination comes into fruition if, if indeed it does, and I'll say when it does really, um, that can be a concept that can be explored, but um, um, without uh, without sort of pursuing that further, I don't, I don't think it was a great idea. And I think that the, the, the government and so and the subsequent um, public health um, execs realised that that was not the way that we should go about things. Now, the second part of your question was, I guess, related to where we are now. Um, and uh, if that's in reference to, again, herd immunity, then it, it, again, it, it really does depend, in my humble opinion, uh, on the on the use of a vaccine, uh, and that's mm. a long way off, uh, unfortunately. So, so in the meantime, now, I mean, the UK. I mean, I just I, I was just reading something a while ago. If I can if I can find it, mm. and on the BBC, and I believe the Matt Hancock actually did an update. Uh, there was a saying that there have been what hundred thousand per week that they wanted to be tested. So this is now going on to testing. Um, yeah. The other thing I'll just mention with vaccination, yeah. Um, yeah. just very briefly, is um, there are moves afoot in this country, in Germany, in the United States, to try and get vaccinations as quickly as possible mm. and as safely as possible. Um, and that does require, obviously, um, persons to volunteer themselves for vaccination programs. And I'm not an advocate for that. I'm just making sure that people are aware that that's something that is proactively being done. Um, um, and that will obviously serve purpose for vaccinations in the future. Yeah. Um, now, question point in regards to testing. Yes. Um, my my feeling here is that we are woefully under testing, um, and um, you will, most people may have heard today by Matt Conkup that we um, are at least in a position to get testing out to NHS health staff um, in order to um, to get their status known. Um, which I'm particularly happy with. Um, I think the struggle so far has been getting things out. Um, and I think admittedly the government is, 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 is aware that they have, um, they could, they, there are areas that they could have improved upon <coughs> their, yeah. their sort of getting uh, out of personal protective equipment, which we'll touch on in a second, but testing as well across the board. Yeah. And so um, testing does matter. It matters because we're able to not only ascertain whether somebody has the condition, but it also has implications as to the um, persons who may well be able to get back to work. So currently, if you are in self-isolation, um, if you have a household member that is affected with this um, this condition of COVID-19, um, then you are asked to self-isolate for a period of up to 14 days. Now, if you have the condition, then you are self-isolating for seven days. But if you're self-isolating for 14 days and you are not aware of you having the condition, then the testing will help in that matter because if you don't, if you test negative, then you can go back to work, and that's the whole the whole issue. Now there are difficulties in the tests themselves, and I think that we want the best quality of tests. Quite obviously, we don't want to just test people and give them the false assurance that they're fit and healthy, or yes. even you know the the, the 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 unfortunate diagnosis of saying you have COVID and you you you, you test negative, you test positively, but we actually don't have the condition itself. So uh, we need good mm. tests. Um, and I'm hopeful that the tests that we do have that are going to be um, farmed out, shipped out towards the NHS hospitals and, pri and, and providers will um, will be able to, to give us this answer because we crucially need it. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned about with the testing that the testing can actually give false... false results. Um, yeah, well, this, this is the thing, Silbon. So mm. I want people to understand that um, no test is foolproof, okay? We, we we aim for a particular standard in the test that we have yes. um, regardless of COVID I'm talking about across <clears> the board <throat> in, in medicine and tests are used alongside clinical judgment and acumen to make a diagnosis so um, the test here does matter and it works alongside other um, bits of information that we have at hand um, but it will help for other things that I've already described already in, in terms of in terms of people who are isolating at home um, and I'm hopeful that that will, mm -hmm. that will is something that we get very soon. We've got that assurance today from Matt Hancock. I keep mentioning his name. He's the health yes. secretary. So we need him yes. to, to make good on this um, promise and yes. deliver the tests to the front line because we need it now. So therefore, the, the focus of testing now, it is not 
of the average Joe bloke on the street who is coughing and having all these um, well, um, well, symptoms. No. Yeah, well, no, it, the, the, the thing here is if you have, if you believe you have symptoms of COVID, <coughs> then you are instructed with that little cough there. <laughs> 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 then, um, then I, um, the, the thing to do here is to ring 111, okay? And they yes. will give you the advice that's required um, for you personally, given yeah. the information that you give to them. So that's the first thing. Um, now, there is going to be a subsection of people who fit a particular requirement, and then they'll be asked to they'll be invited for a test. OK, um, what I'm saying here is I'm not I'm, I'm not saying that health workers are above the standard of the rest of the population. Mm. But I think at this moment in time, if we are working in the hospital environment and we're being asked to see patients and we're not certain of our current standard because our status sorry because uh, again i'm sure people are aware you can be asymptomatic meaning you do not have symptoms of of coronavirus of covid19 but mm. you actually have the the, the, the virus itself it's laying, laying, laying and so that's why it's important um if we're if we're asked to to treat patients which we are obviously mm. and we want to treat patients in the nhs and um, across the world if we're asked to te treat our patients, then we need to know whether or not we're positive or negative, because we don't okay. want to unwillingly treat patients who are not um, uh, uh, not un not unwell with COVID, treat mm. them, and then have ourselves pass that virus onto them, because that increases the demand on the NHS. But more 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 importantly, um, it, it increases the risk of loss of life. I, I do find it concerning the bit, and I'm sure a person is is, is thinking about this. If someone goes to the NHS, someone is showing all the symptoms, a cough and got a fever, and the test is now done and they're actually saying negative. Mm -hmm. Now, the family will be very happy. Mm -hmm. The family will be so excited mm -hmm. and welcome this family member back into the fold. Mm -hmm. And uh, is well, that's, that, that's well, a tricky... Well, that's why I say it, it, yeah. there's got to be an, an element of, of mm. um, clinical judgment here, okay? Yes. So, um, as I alluded to right early on in this discussion regarding um, testing, testing is, is, a, is a component of our, of our clinical diagnosis. And I'll yeah. say it again, we use our own clinical acumen, our clinical judgment in regards to the status of how somebody is. We use mm. other methods. So uh, just for example, so just for example, we will check the, the levels of oxygen in the blood. We'll check the blood pressure, um, but we we'll also want the testing as well. Um, so if, if somebody in that scenario, as you displayed there, had all of the key indicators for COVID and mm. you felt actually this is probably COVID, even though the tests have you know, are come back negative, you can yes. you still treat them in the, in the manner of fashion as they, as they are positive because the positivity of tests can come later on down the track. So, right. so that, that's, the, that's the thing. So we don't go off the test and say, oh, the test is completely fine. We'll just ignore everything else and throw it out. The yeah. No, no, no. We, we'd look at other key clinical <clears throat> indicators. Emil Reynolds, yeah, Emil Reynolds just asked a question there. Um, it's not what we were focusing on, because we're going to come back, on the, but just because I don't want to miss it. Sure, how sure. how safe are the vaccination programs, even though there's not a vaccine yet? That's that's a very good question. And yes. I think it's it's difficult to answer that question on the um on the um on the process of, of, of just the question itself so it says how safe are the, are the vaccination program so I, I take it what he what the, the person is asking there is the vaccinations that are currently in use how yes. safe they are that's that's what i'm taking as the question rather than the work up to getting a vaccine and people being um subject to um to to, to vaccinations before it's released across the public so i'll, I'll answer the former question rather than the latter and in terms of the vaccinations that are out there, um, the, the programs that are in place from um, from from childhood through throughout the younger younger years, they are safe programs that should be adopted. And if they are adopted by particular government agencies and they're quite happy with the way that they um, these these vaccination programs are, are conducted, then that that's safe um, for, for 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 processing. And I think what I want people to be aware of is that. Um, particular links of, of, um, of vaccinations, for example, and this may well be where um, the, the question is alluding to sort of MMR and autism, that those facts are not non-factual, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, yes. So the, the data has been studied year after year, uh, over and over, and there's no um, basis for the arguments to suggest that MMR um, is associated with autism, for example. Um, 
So I just want to make that point painfully clear. Now, yes. I, I, I can't, and the second part, which may well be related to this question, how safe are, 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 the, are, the, are the current vaccinations that are in, are in um, the process of, 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 of targeting COVID-19? I can't comment on, on that because I'm not involved in that program. Yes. Um, but with every, um, with every vaccine that has come to fruition, um, there will be testing programs out there to look at the, um, the, the, the safety profile of the vaccine itself. Yes. And that's as simply as I can really put it. Yeah. Uh, Richard Davis mentioned, while waiting for the test, could it be advisable for the person to self-isolate? Well, it, it couldn't be ab um, uh, advisable. It is advisable, okay? Yeah. So we have to self-isolate, okay? Um, Once you have a cough, have, isn't it? Yeah, if, if, you, if, you, if you have a persistent cough, yeah. This is this is all stipulated by the government. How many times did I call for a while ago? One, two, three. <laughs> just, just the once. I'm counting this. For the purpose of tonight, I'll, I'll count for yeah. the public. All right. No, but in, in all seriousness, persistent cough, high fever. That's all I want people to take away. If you have those symptoms, call one one one. They'll give you the advice and guidance, and mm. you take it from there. And um, there are going to be GP surgeries that will be um, open still for consultation. Um, but the first and foremost, I think, trying one one one, and if they point you to was your GP, then you, you contact your GP. Right, right, right. I, I, I just continue just quickly yeah. before we go on to the next point because I think by us saying people should put questions in, they're actually coming in, so we've got to deal with it as it comes. I don't lose it, I, I, and and this is really a good point. I'm concerned at the number of NHS employees that are losing their lives. I'm sure that at the time of entering the profession, they did not expect to be losing their lives in the course of their work. It's like an ethics question, isn't it? It is. It is. I, and I, you know, I can speak on my personal feeling on this. I didn't enter medicine feeling that I would have a, a potential loss of life. There are risks in any job that you do, um, but it, it wasn't first and foremost. This kind of scenario. Um, isn't something you think of every day, um, but quite obviously we have to realise that now. Um, and this point of, of question leads on quite nicely to another thing that's um, I feel quite dear about. So you can see I'm quite passionate about the idea of testing. Yes. But um, the the other thing here is personal protective equipment. Um, and again, um, whilst it's been a, a topic for discussion for the past few weeks, I feel that there's a, a, a need for us to get this done. We need to get on top of personal protective equipment and get it out there to, to, to health caregivers um, yes. um, primarily. Um, and I'm gonna say that with my NHS hat mm. on, but also yes. um, to, to key workers, because you know, it, it, this thing is, 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 is really affecting people who are on the front line, whether you're on the front line in an NHS practice yes. or the front line in a supermarket, it's the same difference in my in my viewpoint. Okay, I'm speaking just from my personal yes. viewpoint here, because it's the number of people that you're coming into contact with um, that puts you at greater risk um, yes. of, of, of of picking up a virus, essentially. Yes. Which is why we're asked to stay at home. We're asked to stay yes. at home, be within our family circle. You have a family unit, and um, you stay within that family unit. If you uh, if one of the persons in the family unit has it, then so be it the family unit is, is protecting themselves yes. and protecting everybody else, and protecting the NHS. So that's why I say that the, the personal protective equipment um, is, is, is crucial. And the, the question really raises a great point. And I can say that um, the, 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 the worry about personal protective equipment um, yes. is, has been raised by persons in the public, health givers um, across the board. I'm not saying anything that isn't in the public domain, um, and it, it is a it is a very good point. Um, we are, um, I would say, we are guided by the World Health Organization in that regard in terms of what uh, personal protective equipment is required for the different roles um, within a hospital, because there are certain different roles. Um, and um, what I what I need to make clear is that that needs to happen. And I think one of the things I would say um, from uh, from a and this is to be too political here. Yes. But, you know, we are obviously um, in the midst of Brexit. All right. Mm. And one of the things that um, 
I think was 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 thought about was the idea of manufacturing and jobs and etc being, yes. being being uh, being useful at home. Okay, and this is the ideal time for manufacturing <coughs> for pe people who are able to create personal protective equipment. Yes. Ventilators we already know about ventilators and, and potentially. And I'm not advertising here, but Dyson, quite obviously, yes. um, helping in that regard. Why it is, I have to ask a question here, why it is that we can't get some homemade personal protective equipment and, and utilize the workforce that we have in this country yes. um, to, to sort of get that off the ground. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going along the lines of for or against Brexit. Yes. We are Brexiting. Why it is that we can't get that generated I is the question I would ask. Mm. There's some key. Uh, there's a few points that we go, we want to go, but I I just I pick two more questions and then so, we jump so along. I've, Sorry, I've yeah. got a special guest joining me. As yes, well. <clears throat> he's just coming along as well. Um, I think you alluded to earlier already. Okay. Okay. Hi, Silborn. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. Are you going to find a seat for her, David? Uh, <laughs> so we have to sit quite, quite, quite close together. Okay, but well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming on. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Carla Campbell-Burton. She's an epidemiologist who currently works for a pharmaceutical consulting firm and had previously worked for the Center of Disease Control in North America. She's a background in public health and is a fitness fanatic in her spare time. That was the reason why she was not here, just to let you know. <laughs> She's been actually jumping around. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you have seen a video which I've shared where they have this program which is called The Coach, On The Coach, and they do part one, part two. And uh, she was making some some words because she was very passionate. And she was, who are you swearing on what? But I, I became her fan, man. I mean, I called them this morning and I, and I said, David, actually, is your wife I want on the phone, man. I want her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not her fan, you know, because you're very passionate, you know. Um, so, Carla, how are you? What's your take on um, the testing on the COVID bit now? Yes. Um, well, I mean, I think it's very important um, that uh, we've not been able to secure sufficient tests um, is quite concerning, especially that we are in a pandemic situation. Yes. Um, I don't know what points David has made on this already, but obviously I would say that um, frontline healthcare workers would need to be prioritized and also um, members of the general public um, who may or may not be experiencing symptoms. We are on a essentially national, uh, a national lockdown um, and to have these sorts of measures in place for uh, you know, such an extended period of time, I really do think there needs to be um, a, a, a bigger initiative on getting people tested so we can <coughs> sort of um, you know, get on with, uh, get on with uh, what's happening because obviously the solution can't be for us to be locked down um, you know, indefinitely. Um, you know, testing would need to be prioritized. I think frontline healthcare workers um, and those at highest risk, um, you know, they would need to be tested first. But um, even within the community, that also needs to be important. And and my my next question is about um, and this is this is a question which we're going to turn on to, um, and it is: Are we protecting our key workers PPE? But before I go there, let me just shut off this particular point that we're on with a question. Which has been put by uh, 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 well, well, there's so many th questions going up. I'm, I'm not losing it. I think it was yeah. Someone has said, "How long will this virus last in their system if someone has been tested positive? Someone has been tested. How long will the virus last in their system?" I know this is a developing thing. Think, and it's new to yeah, sure. So, and that, that's the thing with novel viruses like this um it's very difficult for anyone to answer that that question i think early on in the disease course those questions as to whether or not immunity would be uh, uh for long uh, the longevity of immunity and that's the question that's being asked i believe so um early doors in china for example there were questions as to whether the virus re-entered the body again um but then there were secondary uh, thoughts that actually maybe that people has just hadn't re recovered from the first initial onslaught mm -hmm. we know that there's going to be a period of immunity i can't sit here and i don't think anybody can really give anybody that uh, sort of reassurance that once you've had the, the virus that you are going to be immune for life um and that's the, the fundamental reason that we need to develop um vaccines because we know we can get a, a greater longevity with them um and and, and hopefully then help 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 us get back to a state where we were previously yeah are, are, are we protecting you guys 
Are you guys protected? Key workers. So, PPE. so um, <coughs> the the thing here is there is levels of protection available. Okay. The question is whether they they are they're enough. Okay. And uh, I, and in addition just, to being enough, I think it's also adequate. What's the quality of the protection? Yeah. Yeah, that most definitely. So, um, I, and I can't speak for every hospital that's out there, and I know that there is an information number if persons who work in hospitals are worried about the levels of protection that are yes. available in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. But we just need more. I mean, I, I, I don't think anybody can sit here and say, oh, well, you know, get, there's enough. I, I don't think there is enough. I think we just need more. We need to get it processed. We need to get it in the hospitals. We need to get people who are on the front line First and foremost, those PP um, 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 bits of material because mm. you just need to get it sorted um, and, and not sort of um, waste time on this matter. It just needs to get done, um, uh, and and that's that. Yeah, and as, as a candy root who said, midwives and health visitors who work in the community are also especially at risk, and should be given equal priority status. The WHO are somewhat responsible for the poor rollout of PPE globally as they are overseas for global health and would have been aware of COVID before it agreed out of one. Carla, what's your take on that? What the person said? Um, well, yeah, I mean, care workers in any setting, whether it's hospital setting or um, care homes, um, and then also people who are deemed to be key workers, they all you know, need PPE. Um, so in terms of how you would prioritize that, I mean, that's, that's always a matter for debate, um, but it, it, all of them, you know, would need to be prioritized. Um, in terms of uh, the WHO, um, I can't speak specifically in terms of what their role would be. Um, they typically tend to act as a coordinating center, um, but countries are responsible for sourcing their own uh, personal protective equipment. So yes. this one really does come down to um, the UK government and the public health system within this country, um, you know, being responsible for providing uh, that. Um, it's surprising that there's the lack of um, even stockpiling that would have happened. Um, that, you know, it's, it seems that, you know, since the onset, there has been insufficient supply. Um, do you think once this um, pandemic period is over, there really will need to be um, <clears throat> A period of time where they sit down and evaluate sort of how prepared they are for something like that should this happen again in all likelihood it will happen again so um we should never be in this sort of situation whereby uh, you know we're scrambling for this type of this this type of equipment right right Pan pandemic pandemic um is not something that happens every every day you know no, <laughs> no. but their their yeah. pandemic preparedness um yes in all you know developed countries even developing countries their pandemic plans so no we would definitely wouldn't want to have a pandemic happening every year that would be uh, terrible but um you know, there are there are plans in place so um public health part of public health's remit is to plan for these you know, hopefully rare events, yes. but plans should have, should be taking place. And um, the availability of PPE, for example, should definitely form a core component of that plan. And I'm just um, concerned that that wasn't the case. And I mean, it's, it's not a UK problem only. It's a problem, you know, across the board, across many Western countries, countries that you would expect to have quite um, developed public health systems. Mm. Unfortunately, this time it seems as though they've dropped the ball so i don't know if that's due to years of funding i was involved in the h1n1 um, yes. pandemic um, coordinating surveillance for canada and sort of one of the um, things that came out from that one was that we almost overreacted yes. <laughs> and this one it's sort of been you know the total inverse and you can if you cast your mind 10 years back i mean people's memories are quite short um the outcome or the impact of that pandemic you know maybe people don't even remember it whereas this one is it's so much more severe it's had such you know <clears throat> such an impact on you know how we are you know just able to live our lives and that you know it seems as though we were almost caught with our pants down just yes. to you know, use a statement um you have to wonder sort of what's happened um how did how did that, something like that happen because you know this isn't the first you know 
pandemic that public health is dealing with. We had the one, you know, 10 years ago, H1N1. We had SARS, which is a more similar virus to the one that's circulating now. So we have experience. And yes. um, so some of those questions, you know, we need answers to those questions. David? Yeah, so I mean, and Carla, Carla makes a really good point in that, yes, uh, in answering the question about pandemics, yes, they don't yes. happen every day, but we haven't seen the groundwork that takes place to stop these um, um, sort of this entity taking place, if that makes sense. So, yes. you know, there would have been a lot of work, I'm sure, in regards to other viruses that we as a general public may not have been aware of. We're, we're aware of the big ones, okay? Swine flu, H1N1, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, it was the, I mean, we need to know the answers to whether the groundwork was laid in this regard for this particular virus. And, and, and if it wasn't laid, then why not? And why was the response the way that it was? Um, and, and I think those are the key things that we need. Once, once this current crisis is over, those are the key things that we need to try and understand, reflect on, and then build upon so that this, the likelihood of this is reduced. Okay. That's what we, that's essentially what we need to do because we can't keep having this occur obviously we're not out of the woods yet with this and i don't want to look too far in the future but we do have to try and look to the future for for, for degree of positivity and we need to learn from this for sure and, yes. and 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 take those lessons learned into the future so so we can reduce this 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 burden of this this horrible disease there there, there, there was a, a a video going around and it's a, a nurse in the states i think she's a medical practitioner or so and she said she's resigned she quit her job because mm. she has underlying sicknesses and they wanted her to go into a COVID ward. And one of the questions that someone just said is that can a nurse decide not to work, decide to turn her back? Um, mm. Don't want to work because scared, you know, of course. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. Or a professional or medical that, professional. That's a, that's a really difficult question to sort of answer. Um, yes. I think in regards to the way that we approach things, um, we have to think about our patients yes we also has to think about ourselves and and the care that we can afford to our patients and everybody's individual in that regard so i cannot uh, sit here and say um one way or the other um, i can only talk about how i would feel in a particular situation yes. um, and whether i feel that i'd be doing a disservice to my patients by proceeding in a particular manner or fashion and so for this particular nurse mm -hmm. um, i can't speak on her truth she obviously expressed her truth um, and what she felt at the time was happening to her. I, I don't know about the, the, the ramifications or the ins and outs yes. of, of that situation. Um, if I can qualify that question also, they said, if they're not supplied with PPE. Yeah. So um, in terms of PPE, you have to feel that you are protected and you have to raise those concerns with the people within your environment. And you need to speak to those persons to make those concerns known. And and I think that's just, that's the that's the that's the that's the thing I would take out of this. And I don't know what discussions, so I can't comment any further than that. Really, yes. um, I want to make sure I am safe to practice the job that I can do in the environment that I'm being asked to do. Um, and if and if and if I felt that those were not being listened to, then I'd escalate within the teams um, that, I, uh, that that operate within my particular division and escalate all the way up to 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 to, to the persons. So I make the point clear. But there has to be also the, the realization that we have to be, be realistic with the kit that we have and if we if, if for the job that you're doing as well so there, there is a difficulty in, in in speaking on persons um in their particular roles and yes. their responsibilities now for example you know I, I i wouldn't expect um somebody i'm gonna keep gonna go off piste here a little bit but i wouldn't expect to say a farmer who's in the middle of the peak district to wear a hazmat suit to mm. um, sort of milk his cow, okay? So there's got to be a realization as to the, the job that you're doing being fit for the PPE that's required. Yes. Um, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a different discussion to be had, um, but you know, it's a discussion nonetheless. Fantastic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we see lots of comments which are being made, which we look at them after. Um, I'm joined with um, Dr. Carla Burton and uh, Mr. Uh, David Burton. Uh, uh, David and I were on the same level medically because we're both misters. I understand mister is a higher level, so you know you, you <laughs> don't call him doctor. Yeah, yeah, we don't call it. We don't call ourselves doctors. We say <laughs> mister. <laughs> so I, I thank them so much for coming on and um, to really share their talent. I really 
and it was on short notice. Uh, my, my next question, as you can see, which was crawling there, uh, this lockdown, and uh, the question was put to the government, when will this lockdown go? And uh, many people are sometimes, there's this, there's this balancing line with the isolation and the quarantine and everybody's um, um, with COVID in their house. And now we're all released. Yes, let's go for the world. Will we create a, a second pandemic, if anything? How, how, what, what would be the, what's the disadvantage and the advantage? What, what's, what's a key thing that the government is looking for or the medical fraternity is looking for to say, let's go, we're free. <laughs> we can go and have dinner. There's a video I'm showing with this guy eating and he's in this restaurant and he's like eating his food and he's just like praising God and saying, hallelujah, I'm back, man, I'm back. You know, <laughs> everybody's waiting to get back, you know. Yeah. What is, yeah. a lot of, uh, there's a few things in there. I hope I can remember all of them. So, um, so in terms of what we would be looking for, typically be looking for to say, okay, it's time we can start loosening some of these lockdown measures would be that the rate of infection would seem to be going um, down or not increasing. So currently, when you look at um, any of the curve lines, they, they still don't seem to be on a, an increase, especially when you look at deaths. Mm -hmm. So whenever we can get to the stage whereby the number of new deaths, you know, either remains consistent for a, a period of time or even starts to decrease, that would be when we would um, want to start saying, okay, we can we can start we can loosen some of these measures up now in terms of do you want to what were what was the first bit of the question because i think there was a there was a lot there yeah the first bit of it was um what are the key ingredients or the key criteria for um stopping the lockdown because when we are inside isolated then with our families and we all have covid or whatever like that we don't know when it's finished and somebody asked a question how do we know and what is the period of time that um, we know that we're, we're, we're clear. What if people just go out now? When do we start another pandemic? Right, so I mean, there's no, there's no clear answer on that. There, you know, you'll never get everyone to, to sort of agree, but obviously the flattening of the curve is sort of the you know, mm. first thing that we'd want to do. Um, the next thing you could look at to see is, well, who are the most at-risk groups? There's different strategies. Um, sort of you know, one strategy would be to say, well, who are the people most at risk? And we know what from what we know so far, we know that you know, older people, sort of over 70, and people with underlying uh, health conditions tend to be more at risk. So these yes. are the people that we really do want to protect. So we might say, um, let's maybe, we'll not let those people out just yet. But we know that younger children, um, younger adults, they seem to either be less at risk for severe outcomes, or if they do get infected, uh, by and large, from what we know with the existing data, obviously, this is an evolving situation, so things can change. They tend to not have as severe disease. So you might want to say, okay, maybe we can start um, opening schools back up again, especially for those uh, younger children, you know, primary and secondary age children, because those are sort of our lower risk groups. Also, maybe more for um, younger adults um, who are also deemed to be in the lower risk categories. Um, so tip, uh, we could still have measures in place whereby known cases could remain isolated um, mm -hmm. or a higher risk could potentially remain isolated. Um, you know, maybe older people, um, you know, for a period of time, they may also need to be isolated. And then you can also look at things like, well, you know, we can start to get everyone back out again, but maybe we have a you know, hold on. Ban uh, you know, we don't we won't have mass gatherings, for example, yes. because that would be an opportunity for the disease to spread. Um, whether or not we maintain sort of, you know, the two meter distancing rule, that um, that uh, that's probably, uh, in my opinion, one of the more experimental measures. Yes. Um, because that's been, you know, the research behind that is typically lab based. Um, so whether or not you're going to get infected just by passing somebody on the street, um, that's probably that one is is not as clear in my mind in terms of the research supporting that obviously if you're going into a work setting there may be still a need to um you know have a, a, a certain level of distance if you're going to be spending a, a period of time in the same room with somebody so we could look at measures around well if we need to get people back into office or you know back into the workplace um what sort of measures could 
be in place. So if they, they if there isn't enough sort of physical distance for everybody, well, then maybe we need to provide them with some mask, for example, yes, um, so yes. that they can do their job. Um, it is a very difficult decision. <coughs> Whatever sort of, um, decision they make, there's there's no risk free um, sort of approach. Yes. There's the, the disease is unfortunately circulating and there's also there's always a risk of, you know, once these measures are um, eased up a little bit that the disease could bounce back. The yes. timing of that bounce back, though, is quite important. Um, flu season tends to start sort of October, November time. Wow. And what you wouldn't want is to have flu um, circulating <coughs> and then also coronavirus yes. circulating. So the timing of that, if, you, if you're going to have, say, a secondary peak, because the, the curve is not necessarily just normally distributed. There won't necessarily just be one peak. There could be two peaks or even you know three peaks. Maybe you want to have that peak, oh, the second peak, I suppose. You might want to have it a little bit earlier um, so you don't have it coinciding with um, flu. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very you know, it's a difficult decision, and you can have a lot of you know, scientists with different opinions. Um, <coughs> people interpret the, the data differently. David, I want to pick up on that point, and I'm just going to put you on full screen as well. OK? OK. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So in, in, in relation to just a, a, a summary. from the virus itself so that will give a key indicator as to whether or not um, persons actually have um, the, the the condition um, I know I think yeah I can see volume is gone uh, so we're having technical difficulties I think Hold on a second. No, I can't, I can't see. I, can't see I think uh, I just, I just, I just saw that. Yeah, the I saw the gun. So um, yeah, I saw a little hiccup there. That is why I tried to do, yeah, keep talking. I can see. Okay, but yeah. so now we can. Yeah. Hopefully okay. you can help it. Fantastic. So good. Good. Um, I'll just recap what I was saying there. Um, just in summary. So what will what will dictate where we go with this is really on the persons that first of all test positive. So again, very important we get those tests out there. Um, that will give uh, an idea as to where we are in terms of flattening of that curve. Um, the second thing that will give us an indicator is those people who have been admitted to hospital with the condition itself and we yes. get a flattening. That, that will be over time. So you'll first find that the number of people who test positive will fall and flatten. Then the number of people who will be admitted to hospital will fall and flatten just because they're being admitted um, after testing yes. for the condition itself. So that makes sense. And then the third thing that will we'll, we'll, we'll sort of guide how we go on with this condition is, is 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 a reduction in the number of people who pass away with COVID, unfortunately. Um, so that will be the guide and indicator in summary, as, as, as my wife has just said. Um, and then, you know, secondary to that, the, you know, it will be a, a, my belief uh, in, in tandem with, 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 with my wife is that you will find that um, we will look um, to to sort of a graded response to how we get people back into their their near normal life yes. um, <clears throat> back in the community, um, looking primarily at people who are least at risk, and then um, getting those people who are, who are more at risk once we're happy um, back into um, the community, and then that's alongside obviously yeah. um, a, a vaccination program um, that we alluded to right at the top of the program. Yeah. Carla, someone asked this question. Um, question for Dr. Carla. Is there any way the UK government could be more prepared to tackle the COVID-19 disease with experience and knowledge of similar diseases over the years? Um, I mean, I think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It's quite an affair. So, I mean, the only sort of, um, you base your um, sort of approach based on what you would have done for yes. pandemics. So, like I said, the last pandemic, true pandemic that we had was um, in 2009. Um, so there were, uh, well, I don't know how the UK approached it. I wasn't in the UK at the time. Um, but from having my experience back in Canada, um, there was an aggressive testing program. Um, I don't think we seemed to, the testing did not seem to be an issue like it was this time in, in terms of why testing is such an issue this time around. Um, and I don't know if you talked about that. I mean, there's there's just a range of issues. In terms yeah, we touched on that. Why yeah. yes. the availability of testing yeah. is an issue and the availability of PPE. So, I mean, we're in the midst of it. Um, yes, there's the public health expertise to deal with pandemics. Um, I suppose this one may be slightly different in that, um, you know, well, like any new disease, you just don't know sort of what, um, you know, the long-term consequences is, if it's going to behave like flu or if it's going to behave like, you know, something else. Um, but in terms of whether or not there is uh, expertise to deal with it, yes, there is. I just think that <coughs> perhaps it, it, it could just be down to funding this time in that perhaps funding funding of health services i mean you know that funding for the nhs they've lost a lot of money real-time dollars over the years and it's it's likely that um public health and public health england has been, and um local authorities actually are the ones that are responsible for public health it's it's also possible that they've also had a reduction in their um funding which you know it, we're seeing the results of that now so um yes there's expertise but it it, the, the available, <coughs> availability of resources seems to be the problem, namely in testing and mainly in PPE. Those are the two biggest things. Um, and those are, you know, those are your two core things that you would need for any, um, to manage any pandemic. And if they're not there, then, you know, you're going to end up in a situation like we are now. But I think it's probably the level. Um, yes. I think this is just uncharted territory for, for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I, I, want to, I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, normally, um, the show lasts for an hour, and we're just at uh, um, nine o'clock now. Are you guys okay? <laughs> you guys okay? Yeah, okay. okay. As as people, are you okay? I think everybody's saying they're cool and they're fine. Great info. Keep going. Um, <clears throat> there's a point I want to flag up though is that why is there not a, a, a great a lot of people keep asking why there's no emphasis on the recovery? Uh, the emphasis is a lot on death and death. And I mean, right now, I just saw it flagged up. 100,000 now worldwide as that. What is the recovery like? Um, what's, your, what's your take on the recovery? And I say this because there were two persons I listened to on BBC Morning, and I'm glad the BBC is now actually putting up a few cases of persons who have recovered. One particular gentleman was, uh, he was at the end of it like, and uh, I think the nurses start to really encourage him. They talk about the beautiful, the wonderfulness of the nurses. There's another lady, she was a patri girl and she's much older now, a um, big, big woman now. She, she said she was giving up. And, but the nurse kept saying, you gotta fight on for your family and everything. And it's like, she digged into her resources and started to fight. With the, with the news of death, 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 and not recovery, 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 don't it has a sort of psychological impact on people who are, who are have COVID? Like they think it's over, you know. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a common sense kind of um, approach to the, the answer to this question. I think you've, you've really hit the nail on the head there. Um, negativity kind of produces further negativity, which kind of produces further negativity, mm. which which doesn't help um, a particular situation. Granted, we have to have a realization um, with any particular situation um, we find ourselves in, um, so you can't bury our head in the sand. Yes. But at the same time. Um, in relation to COVID now, the overwhelming majority of people um, will be fine, okay? The overwhelming majority of people will be fine. Um, and we should obviously do the, the things that we are doing to try and um, reduce the load um, and burden on the NHS and save lives, etc. Mm. Um, but we should also talk about the positive experiences of people who have um, helped in the situation, who have helped save lives, who have helped um, be on the, the front line who have helped um, in, the, in, the, in the key working roles that they uh, are doing, whether that be transportation, whether that be working in supermarkets, whether mm. that be continuing to collect um, garbage, 
that you know, all levels of workers should be reflected positively in this particular scenario. Yes. And then going back to your, your point in terms of recovery, <clears throat> again, yes, I think we should be looking uh, at those persons who've recovered. And I know there have been sporadic news stories of people who, there was one lady that um, uh, who, who had gone through world wars and had gone through- oh, Yes, the that elderly pandemic. lady, yes. Um, yes. And this was nothing to her. So, you know, those those stories we can draw hope from. And I, I would, I would stress that um, the news agencies that are out there could do more um, mm. to sort of put that 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 into the ether um, in order to, to you know to, we, we're in a we're in a period of time where uh, we're asked to self isolate we're in the home um, yes we may you know we'll be enjoying I'm, I've you know, I've enjoyed the, being with my family I'm on annual leave this week so it's been fantastic but at the mm. same time there's going to be a low ebb. Uh, in terms of the, the mood of people generally across the board. I and, think there's a split. So I think, you know, scientifically there is research going on to understand um, yes. you know, why some people get sicker than others. And there will be research being done on those who have survived to understand you know, any particular characteristics. I think a partly of what you're alluding to also is a, some of the sensationalized uh, sort of um, headline grabbing that goes on in sort of mainstream media and yes. other um, you know, social media as well. Um, and, you know, th that's not anything you can really control you know, as a frontline staff or somebody involved in sort of the decision making. But I do think there probably does need to be a bit more balanced um, reporting. But that's not just for yes. you know, COVID. Yes. I think you can say that across the board for you know, many issues within society. Yeah, and 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 in tapping in the final aspect there regarding like like Boris Johnson um, is on the recovery stage accordingly. Does the isolation rule apply to those recovering? Those who have been, like people have been released from the hospital and say, and they clap them and say, bon voyage. Do they just go back into the arms of their family? Does it that's, do really, that? that's a really good question. So yes. once somebody's been deemed fit to be discharged from a hospital, <laughs> once they've been in hospital, um, you know, you're going to you're going to find that there's going to be a recovery period, regardless of whether or not you have COVID or not. Yeah. So I wouldn't expect, you know, somebody who's had a, a a pneumonia to be bouncing down the road running, you know, the day after discharge. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> so um, there'll be a period of recovery is what I'm saying here. Um, and uh, there'll be an assessment as to how fit that person is. And that's an individual thing here, because remember, not everybody um, goes through the same passage in exactly the same fashion. Some patients will be admitted to hospital for a couple of hours, yes. uh, for a day, for 10 days, <coughs> 21 days, however long it takes. So um, uh, individual assessment, I think, is, 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 is what will occur with each and every, every case. Um, but again, if, you, if you've got a pneumonia because of this particular problem, yes. um, your chest is not going to be in the best state. You're going to stay at home regardless. Well, well ladies and gentlemen, um, I think I'm I've made a decision without the the input of the Burtons, and that is, we'll have to have ask them to be our resident, uh, Dr. Hillary or whatever <laughs> like that, to come on at a different time. There are, there are two points I just want to wrap up with. I don't want to keep it too long. Uh, and the, the next one is, and I'm going to read something here, and it's very interesting. And we, we're going to shift over to America a bit. Coronavirus wreck havoc in African-American neighborhood. Black stark statistics from Chicago health officials have underscored the heavy toll of coronavirus and black Americans. Black Chicagoans account for half of all coronavirus cases in the city and more than 70% death, despite making up 30% of the population. Other cities, large black population in Detroit, Milwaukee, New Orleans, New York, have become coronavirus hospitals. The US has recorded nearly 270 virus cases and almost 11,000 deaths. David and Carla, you must have heard <clears throat> while this was happening, this is not, black people won't be affected by this. Um, we've got melanin, it won't affect it by us. And uh, young people won't affect it. What is happening there, David? Can I mean, you have seen the news. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't explain it. What is really happening in America? And is, is there any similarity in the States with the death? Yeah, no, this is, this is a, a really good point of, of, of discussion. Um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll touch on the UK and then we'll go from there. <clears throat> so in the UK, um, we've picked up on this particular uh, data. Um, and so the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Centre um, um, is, is what news agencies have picked up on. And, yes. Um, basically 
run with um, and the speculation here is that um, persons um, in the DNA e community have, are affected disproportionately compared to, um, to, to Caucasian counterparts. Um, and the thing I will say here is with any um, bits of information that you, you get, um, do a bit of investigative journalism yourself um, and try and pick that apart as best you can. And if you can't pick it apart, try and find somebody that can. Yes. And always question what you, what you read. Um, that's my public service disclaimer here. Okay, so yes. I looked at the audit um, myself. Uh, I went through that uh, page to page um, and looked at some of the data. And so what, you, what, what, what happened here is that they compared patients who um, came into ICU, so intensive care units with a pneumonia uh, not related to COVID versus patients who have presented with COVID. Yes. The first thing that struck me was that the numbers were dissimilar. So in one group, you had over 4,000 patients and in the other group, you had 2,000 patients. Yes. So the numbers of patients that you're comparing there is dissimilar. So that's the first thing. And whilst the age of the patients was exactly the same, there was a greater amount of, um, of, of effect, um, particularly in men. So when you looked at the data, 74% of the patients in the COVID group were men and only 51% of the non-COVID group were men. Yes. So, so that's one other thing to bear in mind. And the other point I want to make clear is that there was a difference between the two groups in relation to their body mass index. Um, and so those things aside, when you looked at the data, um, yes, there was a, a, a trend to suggest that um, patients of a, of a, a black and Asian uh, background seem to be affected more so than um, patients um, who were not in that background. It, the, trend is, the trend is there. But you've got to look at the other components that may well be aiding and abetting this whole situation as well. So I think that's the first point I wanted to make clear that whilst we can sometimes see trends in data in medicine, we've got to really pick the bones a little bit to try and get to grips as to whether or not that, that these trends are whole trends yes. uh, or if there is something else um, aiding and abetting. Um, and I think um, Dr. Dr. Campbell Burton would like to talk a bit more about things that can, can affect can affect this sort of statistics? Um, yeah, so there are a few things in terms of just thinking about, <coughs> to go back to the African-American example. Um, we know that if, from what research tells us, if you are African-American, uh, you are more likely to be poor, you are more likely to have underlying health conditions, and you're probably um, more likely to not have access to adequate medical care. Um, so care, from my understanding, in the US is not universally um, available you may need to have um, health care insurance. So if you think, you know, you are you know, not in a great financial situation, you might not be able to afford that, or you yes. may not have access to um, everything. So I think this is a, it's, it's obviously, um, it's an evolving situation. Um, we, I, we can't say, the trend seems to appear if you just look at sort of, you know, the averages, well, you, you, you're 13% of the population, but you're 70% of the deaths, and yeah. you're black. Um, is it just because you're black or is it because, you know, for some of the other um, reasons that just happen to be correlated with being black as well? So it may or may not be that um, black people in America are worse affected. It just may be, uh, it may be a symptom of um, you know, other problems in terms of access to care and yes. other, you know, BMI and you know, a risk factor as well. Um, so if you put all those things together and then you just lump it with you know, African American, then it can seem like they're um, you know, we're more at, you know, but you know, black people in America or even black people in the UK, uh, we may be more um, susceptible uh, to COVID. But that might not it may not be such a straightforward story. And I think it's uh, one of those things that we're going to have to um, you know, see how how it evolves and you know, what the data tells us as we as we start to get more information. So right now, I would not say that um, you know clearly the numbers of black people dying is concerning. But whether or not it's just because they're black or it's because of the other issues, that's not entirely clear at this stage. Uh, I think the, the take home message for, for this is um, if historically, um, I say if uh, this is a, a fact for me and for what we've discussed, talked about, that the, that the, the health single behaviour of, of mm. BAE groups <clears throat> is such that we do not go and sell, seek seek uh, any, um, any, any real degree of... of, 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 of or we feel this we're not, we're not able to access services then um, at this moment in time you have to seek services if you are unwell that being the case for yes. regardless if you have a tickly cough or a persistent cough 
to having chest pain, which may or may not be typical for, for COVID or other ailments. And so that's if you, probably yeah. something I didn't include in the first bit of my answer is that men for black or white are notorious for waiting to, you know, longer than they should for seeking health services. And yes. probably black men in particular are, you know, even worse, there are, there are historical issues around why that might be the case in terms of distrust of the medical system and not having access. Um, so, I mean, we might, that also might be um, some of the reasons that we're seeing you know, behind this as well. Which is why men need to be married. Okay, so married men will, will <laughs> you live longer. So uh, it's a point of uh, action for, for men to settle down. Um, <laughs> well, well, well. You, if, if my good friend Lucian Humphreys is on, we have developed this program and these shows we are doing between the States and, and the UK calling Man Up. Men must man up. Must, must man, up, um, I like that. man up. I, I think we're going to invite him because you touch on a different core. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we're we're going to come back thing. to that. And and Carla, you you can stay away and and watch from him <laughs> when we get into that one day because you might swear. <laughs> well, well, no, honestly, the, the, the take home message is please, 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 if you have symptoms of any description, you know, you, you need to contact health services in yes. your particular area, wherever yeah. you are, um, and don't hesitate in doing so. That's, that's the key thing um, from, from this. And finally, this is the number one and a million dollar question. Do you feel appreciated in the NHS? <laughs> and I tell you why, and I, and I tell you why, because Gina Yasher, I put out something recently about the whitewashing of the, the in the papers and uh and uh you know people are saying that the lack of appreciation for uh black and minority ethnic in the nhs and what they have actually done and build the uk nhs so i'm asking that question when you hear of these things what do you say so um, there's, there's a couple of things here, really. In terms of appreciation, um, I think that's a very personal thing. Yes. Um, some people require heaps of praise, some people don't. Um, um, and uh, you know, I think it's nice to be appreciated, but mm. um, I th we all have our personal reasons to why we do what we do. Um, yes. My personal rationale and reason was to, to sort of help people um, and help them in the best way that I think I could. Um, and that's why I decided to become the person I have in, in medicine, really. Um, and in regards to um, sort of how um, appreciated um, the BME, -E, um, again, I don't like that word, but uh, people from we are, the we're, on the same way. we're on the same know, way. We're on the same way. I know. I know. We're on the same way. <laughs> people in the uh, black community, I, I can't speak on their behalf, but what I would say is yes. um, be the change that you can be and put out yourself in, in the manner that you want to put yourself out so if the if it is that um media sources um are lacking um and i, I raise that question if they are lacking in, in in the representation then forums like this are perfect in terms of um putting out on um, giving a voice to mm -hmm. people who maybe will feel that they don't have a voice and also helping um educate people of uh, uh from a black and asian uh, minority ethnic background um, to 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 be educated in, in in all manners of of discussion, whether that's health, yes. uh, education, finance, um, uh, if if you if if that's the way that, that things have to be done. So, uh, in terms of applauds, I, I mean, I I think it's great that um, people are turning out to applaud NHS workers um, on a on a on, on a weekly basis. If they if that's the best way that they feel that they can acknowledge and appreciate people who work in the NHS, then for however long that lasts, it lasts. Um, people will have their thoughts on that matter, but um, I think if people, you know, everybody has, everybody feels they've got to have a way of appreciating things, and people and, and, and others may well not have a way of appreciating things. Yeah. If, if the clapping is that way, then it's that way. Um, but for but to answer your question in, in short, um, do I feel appreciated? Um, I I feel happy with the job that I do on a daily basis, and I'm I'm thankful. That I'm in a position to be able to help patients on a daily basis, um, and I'm hopeful that it will last for a long, long, long time. So, so in a Jamaican saying, I was a I mean, a business but not body, just to do what we have to do. <laughs> for the, and and yes. for those who need an interpretation, you can a translation. You can always yeah, remind some... the German one, I think. But, um, but yes, so that 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 translates <laughs> to basically not thinking or worrying about what other people think yes. in regards to the way that you do things in your particular endeavors in life and i think that that's 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 somewhat a uh, caribbean mentality i would say 
um, yes. and should be um, and should be maybe greater in the world. You know, not, yes. not worrying about what other people think about you and what you, what you in terms of what you do. Um, but yeah, just be the best that you can be, yes. essentially. And, and Carla, uh, yeah. sorry for the sound box there, but that's that's how I feel. That's all right. And and Carla, while you're not directly work, you're not working with the NHS, but you're still a medical professional. Um, uh, what is your take based on your perception uh, of this whole thing about the appreciation and the white whitewash, and not appreciating the diversity of the NHS based on the images out in the mainstream media? <laughs> Um, I mean, <laughs> I must admit something that I've, I've consumed very little media, generally speaking. So, <laughs> so you didn't um, know. <laughs> I, I will hear these uh, sort of um, these storms and sort of like, you know, via WhatsApp messages, maybe, or yes. um, you know, friends telling me these sorts of things. And if someone's forwarding me a video. Um, I think probably just to speak for myself, I think you need to appreciate yourself as the first part. And yes. if you are happy with what you do, um, I don't have a patient facing role. Um, but I do glean a lot of satisfaction from what I get to do. I feel like I'm privileged to work in the field that I do. I get, you know, the work I do will contribute to helping um, people from, you know, my community and other community, you know, you know, not just my, other communities in my community. So, um, in terms of whether or not I feel appreciated, I appreciate myself. <laughs> um, and David appreciates you. So that's yeah, all that matters. Yeah, <laughs> appreciate me that's fine but if they don't that's also fine um, and I don't take it personally yes that's that's good that's a good one to end on and um I won't go there what Kevin Burton is saying but I'm going to go there and we can just move away from there <laughs> there are quite a few people that associate the virus with the 5g network are they connected in any way what are your thoughts do we move on <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah let, let's, let's move on. I think, um, I think it's, a, it's a contentious subject. Um, and uh, yeah, we move on. We, we, move on. We, we get more information as the as, as scene develops. I say that. Well, I, I want to tell you this um, China is already working on 6G. So I said, for all for Mr. Iki or those guys who are worried about 5G and Russia might be starting 10G, you guys are going to have some it's, headache, it's, man. It's unbelievable. I, I mean, if you just think about this, um, we we can now communicate via video and voice okay yes. what more do we need the internet yes. is fast enough uh, i'm quite happy with my 4g phone yeah i don't want to pay any more for my 4g phone let's just be happy and content let's just be How happy about that? fantastic yeah. well well ladies and gentlemen i um, want to thank you so much for attending and um, also uh mr david burton um gmc registered consultant ophthalmologist surgeon working the nhs thank you so much and his lovely wife dr carla campbell burton epidemiologists going to work for a pharmaceutical consulting firm. Also, they've got this program called The Coach, The Coach Series, and I posted one of the videos up. Can you just give us a little breakdown of the vision behind The Coach Series where you both of you are going on there? <laughs> how, how people can, you know, vision, I find it, I find it interesting. It was, simply, it was simply looking at ways of, uh, of just having humor, a little well, bit. We of... have a bit of spare time, which is not very often, but obviously this um, <laughs> the lockdown has uh, resulted in us having a bit more time together. So we've done a couple of episodes. Couple of episodes but yeah. So <laughs> we yeah. don't have any vision for it yet. It's, it's just sporadic. It's um, it's we've got just... any ideas? <laughs> yeah, we've got ideas. We will quite happily um, potentially discuss them. And it was just the uh, you know, brainchild of both of us just sitting down one day saying, "Well, what what can we share um to 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 others?" Um, and it, there's a whole array of different topics, but yeah, of late COVID has kind of uh, taken over this couch. Um, I don't think we have anything else we could talk about? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, right now it's very difficult. Everything's every other discussion topic is in lockdown, um, but we've touched on things like um, the, the votes that occurred around Brexit. Talked about the fact that how we first met and um, and sort of other things. So um, yeah, that's 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 an ongoing sporadic project. Uh, thanks for mentioning it. Really appreciate that. Um, we've got some good positive feedback from that regard as well. So uh, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Mm. And uh, I was trying to find it a while ago to put it up there, but I oh, can't find oh, it. Oh, oh. <laughs> so uh, well, you, you can you can find it on Facebook. Uh, okay. If you search for this couch. Um, if you're friends of, of 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 both either myself or Carly, we'll we'll also have that on our walls on Facebook as well, uh, as well as on YouTube. So the current sort of hashtag is this couch. And if you put in COVID-19, 
you should be able to pick that up that way as well and that will give you a link back to the other episodes that we've that we've been that we've been involved in so as you can see there's a sort of a, a picture of us in the top left that will give you the giveaway that that the, the that's our particular um, um uh, little baby really um so yeah we, we discuss a whole manner of things uh we've talked talk about a couple of the things that we've just we've touched on today in regards to covid um uh and yeah just a bit of a bit of education a bit of lightheartedness gets a little bit heavy sometimes but more often than not it's uh it's just questions that people may well have burning and they want answers to um and uh and it just gives you a bit more concept and information about what's going on in the world fantastic fantastic well mr burton and uh carla I want to thank you so much and we do appreciate it and of course as you can see a lot of persons have appreciated i would encourage you when you get a chance to really go through the lots of messages and the comments as well yep. because i had to jump across some of them in order for us to move on and um i'll invite you to be our resident because there's going to be developments <laughs> uh is it's like every time there's uh, well i was going to say every time there's an update but they update every night but um but just think about it so we can always follow up on some key okay. points and follow this too yeah. all right carla all right david yeah thank you so much for inviting <laughs> us on really appreciate it thank you for doing what you do as well in yes terms sir of programming and and getting information out to the the community and I think it's a fantastic endeavor and keep it up. Yes. Obviously, I'm not, I don't want to sound paternalistic, but yeah, please keep it up. I think it's yes. it's a great thing, that, a great service that you're offering here. Yes, and, yes. Um, and and uh, I'm truly appreciative of that. No problem. Okay. Thank you both. Have a good night and peace out. Peace out. Okay. Let me see how this goes. One. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for uh, uh, coming on and uh, for being on the show. And thank you so much to Dr. Uh, David Burton, Mr. David Burton and Carla as well, and uh, for their excellent exposure and, and really discussing this particular topic. I always believe that it's very important that um, the professionals speak. I always believe that sometimes we sometimes as media persons um will go on and go on and you know as you can see there's so many different um professionals quote unquote persons who are COVID 19 specialists and i and i do recall one time when there was a, a medical doctor actually in the states and she was actually saying that we don't need to worry about face mask and i found that concerning um but she said you only need a face mask if you just if you have a virus and you spread it out we don't need really face mask, I just really, you know. And then when the tide started to turn now, I started to say, listen, I'm not going to listen to her too much anymore. And there's an overload of different information. So I try to be very um, selective with the information that I get. And even with the news as well, I try to be very selective as to the amount of news that I listen to. So I listen to something in the morning to see what is happening and then catch the prime minister a bit later on in the day. And it is so important that we <clears throat> protect our life balance as well there's a psychologist um bit which i keep reading every time that i come on the show and uh and if if i can actually find it but i, I found it very 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 informative uh, i i must say this information but one of the key ones that he that he said was don't get too caught up in the news every single day right don't get too caught up in the news every single day because um, you will just um, blow your mind and lots of mental health issues which are happening now. So so, uh, so that's just my point there. So listen, thank you very much for coming on and I'm um, the coach for the show. We'll be getting different guests. And also I want to plug, of course, um, my latest show, which was going to be the Business and Lifestyle Live. Business and Lifestyle Live. Where I'll have different guests and these different guests will actually come on the show. And we try to do it for 30 minutes or so this is going to be on YouTube, and we look at five key points. Um, for argument's sake, I had a gentleman the other day, we spoke about five points in working from home, how to be successfully working from home, Mr. Anthony Francis. My next guest um, Wednesday is going to be V. Roberts. She's a PR specialist, um, a branding expert, and she's going to talk about how do you maintain the momentum in a time like this. That's very interesting. Monday, I may have Miss Yannick Page from Jamaica, um, talking about because at the same time people are in a position now where they're isolating, rebranding, re-engaging with their vision, re-engaging with their dreams, and trying to actually 
revamp their life because many times people are so busy and we're so busy that we do not have the time for ourselves. And now we're in a position where we're, we have to have this time for ourselves now, we will actually make things work. And I believe that the plane is getting ready to start to roll. Maybe the guys are actually rubbing down the tires or whatever like that, and to soar. So you got to be ready to soar when things go, because restaurants are going to go crazy. Uh, because a lot of people are just going, ah, oh, let's get into the restaurant. People are going to be flying, traveling. People haven't seen their wedding. There are weddings. I've got one wedding which I'm supposed to go to. That's more than likely is going to be pushed back, if anything like that, unless it's going to be by, you know, video link and social distance applies. And as a matter of fact, social distance, I believe, should change. We should call it, actually, this is what we should call it. We should call it physical distance, because I believe, based on the social network, people are actually even still getting closer and getting to know each other. Anyway, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Like and subscribe to the Silver Show on YouTube and on my channel here as well, uh, Facebook, and subscribe. And please share this video as well for somebody that you know, okay? Peace out and have a good night. And thank you so much for your time. And there are a lot of questions there and uh, for people. And most importantly, stay safe, keep the distance, and have a good life. Love your family. Get to know your family. Pray to God. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not wander. Listen to this. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He prepare food in the presence of my enemies. God bless you. Say, brother.